Welcome back to Transborder Art. We are here at the Perez Museum. Where we are looking behind me uh, is a Jesus Rafael Soto, Penetrable Blue. It's a super awesome installation and um, very interactive. You, you can actually walk right through it. So why don't we take a trip? who was interested in the rituals of ancient America, the power of the female body. It's an impressive artist. We're still here at the Perez Art Museum and we just saw Dicter by Dara Friedman. Dicter means poets and it's really amazing that this artist uses uh, auditions by these German poets uh, just uh, the artist plays around with the medium uh, as a filmmaker I, I really re you know this work resonates with me the artist is pushing what they can do with with synchronicity um, you know with you as as the audience cutting in doing the edits yourself as you go in between all these these characters who are, are talking simultaneously so uh, it really pushes the envelope uh, check it out here we have the work of Cuban artist Glenda Leon uh, cada sonido es una forma de tiempo and it really touches me because each of these plays around with notation lines as you can see in that first picture uh, you can see that she's using braille and I think that's really fascinating um, looks like musical dots but at the same time you, it's a language you feel. Um, what I really like, especially, is this piece over here, this part of it, and it just looks like electric lines with the birds, so music is wonderful, my favorite. Welcome to the Frost Art Museum at Florida International University. We are on the campus of Florida International University in this gorgeous building. Uh, as you can see, light filled and we take advantage of the Miami sky and sun. We are very often the first um, museum that our students ever visit. We also have a wonderful partnership with a local elementary school and the kids come in here and they're excited and they bring their their grandparents and it's it's really a community museum. And we have here Miriam Machado, she's the art director, the educational director of the museum, the Frost Museum, and we have here uh, Jordana Pomeroy, she's the director of the Frost Museum, so they have very interesting things to show us here today. Well, we, we do. This is a wonderful exhibition of really essentially highlights from the Art Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C. And I actually was a curator for a long time in Washington, and I knew about this little museum that was uh, it's under the Organization of American States, the OAS, uh, and it's one like of these wonderful little jewels in D.C. Um, this fabulous collection that was begun uh, in the 60s and they still continue to collect and it is a um, actually it was the brainchild of a very important um, curator named Jose Gomez Sicre who uh, really wanted to create the first museum of modern art of Latin America and what you see here are some just a, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the fantastic treasures that they have in this museum. Um, not only was Jose Gomez Sicre a visionary of how art 
can serve as a diplomatic tool, but he also uh, included women. So a lot of these artists that you see here in continental abstraction are women who were emerging at the time as well, and who remain now uh, recognized as masters of abstraction, lyrical as well as geometric abstraction. I love this work. Can you tell oh us yes, who so this here Kosice is uh, a, a Czechoslovakian artist who was one of the founders of the Mahdi movement. We are very fortunate that in our collection we also have um, other works by Wolf Reutemann, who was also um, related to uh, um, uh, Arden Quinn, and we have samples of that exhibits. Uh, ex objects in the children's room. This is a very playful work of art. It uh, has no real narrative, it's just to enjoy, as the Mari movement was also considered the ludic um, movement. It was just for play and, and enjoyment of the shapes. This area all has uh, on display different types of works that are participatory, and I think Jesus Rafael Soto is one of the best examples of a participatory work. Um, his work is really, um, you know, it draws you in. You must move and also uh, view it from different perspectives. But it's a work that it, the undertone is really that it's a work for everyone. It's not just for certain classes or certain people or those who know, but it's for everyone. So everyone has access to it. And I think that's one of the most, uh, you know, important qualities of his work even with his penetrables that many of us have experienced as well. So we yeah. also put this iPad here because you can see uh, him making the work and that makes yes. it further interactive. Absolutely. And these are like, it's like, like writing in air. You know, if you go over and you see this, it's, it's, it has this amazing perspective. It looks like you can see him. You remember this uh, Picasso writing with light? Yeah. That's what oh, it looks yeah. like with, uh, with the wires. Oh, yeah. It's kinetic. It's, yes, exactly. Yes, kinetic. 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 As, as it is kinetic, you are the one that's moving, though. Yeah. You know, and that's how it creates. It gives the, the viewer some power, too. You right? Absolutely. Participatory, yeah, like you said. Exactly. That is uh, a work by Roberto Mata. And like Soriano, uh, which we have on the, the grand, in the Grand Galleries, he's also interested in the cosmos. So he really worked by just placing. Um, stains or spots on the canvas and then the spots and stains would guide him into creating his own very unique Cosmo and that's how he was working in this particular uh, piece. I love his works, the colors, the spirituality, Yes, you know, and, and the, he works with the line and also the paint, right? The sensitivity yes. of the texture and transparencies. Yes, yes, right? absolutely. You Beautiful. can see that. It's evident in that work. What Mabe is, a, a, for me, it's a really a wonderful exploration into the history of Latin America and seeing um, different aspects of Latin America that I think many of us sometimes uh, are, are not aware of. And uh, this particular artist, Mabe, left um, Japan at the age of 10. And he arrives into uh, at Brazil. And now he's identifying himself as a Brazilian artist. But although he's working in a very unique way, he works on the floor, placing the paint and, and putting it and taking it off at the same time. It's very engaged, he's very involved in the leaving his mark and, and creating these different shapes. You can still see, when you see the finished work, that there is some part of Asian, an Asian visual language there. There's something that you can detect from his, you know, culture. But again, um, being at an international university and being a campus museum, it's very important for us to have these works that allow us to enter into a dialogue with so many different nationalities and how we have to reconcile with where we were born, where we come from, and now where we live. And, and this is a perfect opportunity to enter in those dialogues with our students. Yeah, and one of the questions we ask with this show is, is about the very question of Latin America, because we throw around this term so easily, but you see there isn't a Latin America, and the art shows that so well. I mean, mm -hmm. these are art, artists who come from all over South America, the Caribbean. They have different visual uh, language. They have different uh, the points of origin. Um, and, you know, this is something that we're always sort of challenging. You know, there's, um, we, we don't want to sort of fall into that easy category of just Latin American art, you know, and this is, you can see how diverse Latin America really is. Well, that work is by a Bolivian artist, uh, 
Ines and um, uh, Cordova, and she is taking abstraction to a different level. She's using the textiles and materials that are native to her country and using fabric and, and these pieces to create an abstract work of art. So it's also lovely to see how, you know, all of us, we, we, we turn to our, our origins, but then we take that and use other influences and combine them and how we express our ideas and our feelings through works of art, especially, you know, artists, of course, do that. And, and that, I think, is something that's common in, in many, many areas of the world where artists, you know, always bring in something new, especially in Latin America. You see the influences of others uh, in their work. Cross currents. Yes, cross currents. So you're, you're the ambassadors of the artists. Well, I, we're sur actually, it's, it, glad you brought up that, that, you know, that term because, in fact, this exhibition started because the ambassador, the new ambassador of the OAS, came to us specifically. He recognized the importance of this museum under his uh, aegis, you know, and uh, he knows Miami, of course, is we're the gateway to Latin America. Mm -hmm. So he came to start this conversation. I said, I know your museum very well because I was in Washington. And yes, that museum is meant to be really sort of the visual, you know, it's a sort of a visual uh, embassy, right, for, uh, for the OAS. So he had an interest in promoting this part of the OAS, and we had an interest in promoting the art, and it really worked out well yeah. for us. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, oh. and thank you, Jordana. It thank was you. a pleasure, Graciela. Thank you for the opportunity. We are really pleased to have uh, serve as a venue for this wonderful exhibition of Rafael Soriano's work in his hometown of Miami. Welcome to The Frost and welcome to Rafael Soriano, the artist is mystic. This is an exhibit that was uh, first started at the McMullen Museum in Boston. It was curated by Elizabeth Goizueta and then it traveled to the Long Beach Museum of Art. And now we're so fortunate that it's here at The Frost where my father lived and loved and painted for over 40 years since 1962 that we came uh, from Cuba. So come on in. Yeah. <laughs> So this is um, his work in the geometric phase uh, he was painting in the 1950s. Uh, he was part of the 10 geometric concrete um, abstract painters in Cuba. And I'll show you one of my favorite pieces, which is Luciernaga, Firefly. And he was a master colorist. And this is the kind of painting that was going on in the 1950s in Cuba. And so, um, we were so fortunate to have um, all these beautiful pieces from the 1950s. And if we go over here... I can uh, see there is a difference in the images and a little bit in the colors. Yes, yes. And these two pieces, it's fabulous the way that they put it next to a 1950s piece. And these are two 1940s pieces. And this is how he was painting in the 40s, a very surreal type painting. And then this is how he was painting in the 1950s, geometric. So you can see the difference. And then so what happens in 1962, we come into exile and he's traumatized for two years and he doesn't paint. He starts to paint again after a spiritual reawakening that he had. And so he looked inward for uh, sustenance and his spirituality came across into in the 1970s. You see his work of the geometrics kind of blend with this surreal work. And this is something that Elizabeth Goizueta on her tours would always emphasize how it was a blending of these two that you see in the 1970s where you'd start to see the geometrics become softer and more malleable. Um, and like this piece here is beautiful, La Noche. And I love that moon. The moon, yes. The moon is kind of a recurring thing that is in his, his paintings because he was a nighttime painter. Um, he painted always at night. Why at night? Well, because during the day in Cuba, he was a professor and a director of the School of Fine Arts and Matanzas. And when he came here to the United States, he was um, the art director for Popular Mechanics. And so he worked during the day. But at night, he always said that that's when the creativity would come to him. 
Okay, so he let's painted see it more there. of, you, of and, his paintings. And, and Hortensia talks about, as a child, lying in bed and hearing her father beginning his painting session with music. He had quite eclectic music taste. Yes, he always painted with music. Uh, he liked classical. He liked African tribal music, electronic type music. Uh, he even listened to Grace Jones in the 70s and, and the early 80s. He loved uh, Grace Jones. And so I would, as a child, always hear the music. and. It always made me very joyful because I knew that he was at his happiest because he was painting when I would hear the music. And so here you have some paintings from more, his more mature phase in the 90s, and you see these beautiful blue paintings. Um, this is Cabeza Chisada, Nave Flotante, um, El Hechizo de la Noche, and these blues have to do very much with his recollection of the Bay of Matanzas, which he would look out and it would change color sometimes six or seven times during the day, he would explain to me. And, um, and I must say, I cannot talk about my father without talking about my mother, who was the carpenter who mounted his canvases and who really was his number one fan. Wow, so, that's yeah. A yeah, so definitely. You, you also notice that we have, we took uh, a lot, it took us a lot of time to figure out which uh, purple to use on the walls, because the, you know, the, the feeling of the, the paintings completely changes, and we first tried some darker purple, and it muddied. It muddied the paintings, and with this, we felt like it, you could really feel and sense the light coming from inside the painting, which was so important to to his work. Yeah, so, mystical. Mystical. Yes, yeah. mystical. Yes, and, and I hope you get a sense of really his essence is here on these walls. He was a very spiritual man. Uh, he was a humble man. He was a man of very few words. And I'll show you a very uh, important piece and a favorite of mine, which is La Angustia del Olvido. And it's a 1996 piece. And he was a man of very few words, but he was diagnosed with dementia. And this is what he painted. And this is what he felt. And I don't think you need words to know exactly how he felt. And my father is a universal painter. He paints the human experience. And right. I think people are drawn to Very that. They connect Yes, they connect connect yeah. to the work. Because we're the only one of the museums that decided to actually include the studio of Rafael Soriano. So why don't we go and see the studio? It says, please do not enter, but that does not apply to the director or to Hortensia. <laughs> Here we go. So come on in. Thank you. So this is a beautiful uh, recreation of my father's studio, and Jordana can talk a little bit more about her idea. Well, you know, I, I came to the Soriano household, and I wasn't sure I was at the right house. I looked in the window, and I saw all of these paintings all hung cheek to jowl on the, in the living room. This is supposed to be the place I knocked on the door, and... Um, was brought inside, and the, the studio is really in the enclosed Florida room. Yes. And when I walked in, I really felt the presence of, of her father, and part of it was because of the furniture. It was really set up just like he left the studio momentarily to have a cafecito or something. So, yeah, yeah. So and, I, and so this is his easel, and an interesting story is that this is the easel that we bought in 1965 at a thrift shop for three dollars. So this is what he painted many of these masterpieces on this uh, easel, and there's his palette and his brushes and his oil paints and the, and the chair that, that he painted. I can almost see him sitting here yeah. hearing the music and just painting. Hi, my name is Susan Gladstone. I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. Very happy to welcome you here. And I'd like to introduce you to our guest artists. This is Veronica Salzberg and Eric Goldenberg. And this is their fabulous exhibition called Subject to Interpretation, which we're very proud to be exhibiting here during Art Basel. So the sonic sculptures of Monat Studio are really uh, designed to work better with the body in an organic way, in a natural way. And we designed this uh, violin, which is very particular. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> 
what you're looking at here is a 3D printed violin in titanium, which is a very rare uh, material for prints, and it was done by a company that makes uh, components for engines of airplanes. So this, plus the fact that it's completely changing what we understand as the form of an existing violin, and it's made to adapt to our body in multiple ways, um, makes it quite an extraordinary artifact. And I think it has caught on a lot with the public because it's all of a sudden brings a completely new uh, form to something that exists many years. Already, it can right? also be, be play in a position like with your legs and uh, yeah, not it's only uh, a segmental violin. In that way it becomes a different thing. instrument. It's like a viola da gamba, what it's called. This one is a, is a guitar, it's a six string guitar in this case. We did not want to mess with, this, with the number of strings, but what's interesting is that the body in a way is much more lightweight than a usual guitar. And um, it's done so that the actual instrument is just the neck. The neck by itself is, is enough for the guitar. It has a pickup, it has a, a, a part that is removable to change the strings, but what, what we design is this, right? We're concerned with designing the ba special bodies for the human bodies, things that sort of enter into a mutual relation. Well, this installation uh, was, um, we, we made it specifically for La Cole, for, for the museum, for uh, this exhibit. Uh, it was made in, in nine different parts and it has um, sound attached to it. The Jewish culture has, uh, it's very related with numbers and, and the, lum the numbers means different things. And uh, so that's why we thought of the number nine applied to it. And, and also because it's like all the, it works as a network um, communication in between the parts, one to the yeah. other. Um, the idea that um, one can represent somewhat what it means to be in a different country and yet be related to society or this particular community, it reminds us and also being, you know, uh, being in, in, in connection, right? Being uh, in that way. So each one of these panels is composed of many elements that represent the multiple at the same time the singular. I'm Victoria Modesta and I'm a bionic pop artist. When we get to the stage where we get into that final kind of uh, performance character, it's actually probably going to be a surprise to me just as much as it will be to you. It's, I guess it's like exploring an identity that this new equipment and silhouette will sort of give me. When we engage in a collaboration with Victoria Modesta, who's a first bionic pop singer, pop artist, who ha is an amputee, and she had to uh, remove uh, her from her knee down um, one of her legs and had many designers and artists create amazing pieces for her. So she's sort of, in a way, converting her own body into art and to a new mode of expression. And we designed for her a new leg, which is visible in some of these panels. And we also designed a sonic bustier, bustier because this, um, this bustier has these kind of tusks that are in front of her and have sensors that act, trigger sounds and allow her to modify the sound by moving her fingers through those sensors. I think that a lot of people disregard technology and science as this kind of cold thing that means, you know, gadgets and stuff, but it's like, I think that it becomes really beautiful when you mix it with human kind of meaning and purpose and you really you know, kind of gel with it for a reason, right? It's not about like, look how many lights I have. It's like, what is it doing to you? What is it trying to say? You know? This is Ruth Gruber. Ruth Gruber was born in 1911 in Brooklyn, New York, and she was an absolutely amazing photojournalist and writer. And she was able to capture amazing bits of history. Uh, her life was quite an adventure that she was able to share with us 
through her writings and her amazing photographs, and we're very proud to be able to share them with the world. They did come from the International Center of Photography in New York. In she York. was the first correspondent to travel to the Soviet Arctic. She was a very young woman at the time, in her 20s. It was quite an adventure. She flew all the way uh, up to the Soviet Arctic, and uh, she took these wonderful photographs of life there. It's a place no one had ever been at the time. It was quite a scoop at the time, a new scoop, and it was the beginning of her adventurous travels that she continued to do throughout her life. She lived to be 105. The Hope picture sort of stems from here. This is the Exodus, which is a very famous and well-known uh, ship. It was a group of Holocaust survivors trying very hard to get into what was then Palestine. Uh, they were not able on this particular ship to make it, uh, although eventually they did. But at that time, uh, the Holocaust survivors who were not able to get into Palestine were most frequently sent to, the, to Cyprus to an internment camp. And that's where that photograph takes place. So okay, let's look that at that. Photograph. I had mentioned this as one of my favorite photographs because it tells an entire story in one photograph. This is the place where many of the Holocaust survivors who were trying to get into what would become the state of Israel were sent. Uh, and it was in, on Cyprus where they were living also in very much of a camp. But they had been liberated from the Holocaust and they were beginning their new lives. And this photograph really captures that. Here's a young man, obviously quite thin. We know from history he's probably been through a great ordeal and he's still not living anywhere nice. But he's ready to start his new life. And she's captured in this one photograph the whole concept of hope and new life and beginning again. And it, an entire book could be written just from this one photograph. And that was the beauty of her photograph. She could capture so much in one, one photo. It's so beautiful that she yes. recorded all this history. We, that is, that's correct, yes. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so Thank much. You soon.